Hello and welcome to the Celtic Collection Volume 2. A lot's been happening since the first edition on and off the field. The departure of Tony Cascarino, the introduction of new defenders Tony Mowbray and Tom Boyd and the emergence in the first team as number one goalkeeper Gorn Marshall. It's hard to believe but it's 25 years since Celtic won the European Cup against Inter Milan. And we'll be speaking to the man who scored the winning goal, of course Stevie Chalmers, still working at Celtic Park. Coming up also, coaching hints from Tommy Craig and your chance to win a Celtic Collection competition. But first of all, to matters off-field, to the boardroom and the introduction of a new chairman, Kevin Kelly. My grandfather was the first captain of the club, became a director, became chairman. The late Sir Robert Kelly was my uncle and he was chairman here for many years and was tremendously successful for the club. And I'm delighted to take over now after the run that Jack McGinn had and as you know centenary year was his year and we won the double so if I achieve something like that in my time I'll be absolutely pleased. You were always very close to your uncle Bob? Very close all the years and he was such a powerful person not just in Celtic football circles but in the SFA and the league as well so he was a great administrator, great foresight, great vision and a supreme optimist I would say. And on the park with Liam Brady in charge now, and you'll be hoping that uh, with someone with his reputation in European football that the club will grow on the field, the most important thing? Well, I think you all recognise that Liam Brady is a top quality person. I mean, he's played at the very highest level and has a great grasp of the game. And I think his style of play is what Celtic are looking to achieve. And I know already he's beginning to formulate his plans. And one of the things he has done is initiate another youth policy. We've always had a reputation of rearing our own players, but it's imperative now with the financial restraints that we have more and more Celtic boys coming through. Lineman coming in, it's off the post. This time it spins across the line from O'Neill. Collins into the path of Galloway, might have a shot. Helping Celtic towards these kind of victories is someone who burst into the first team this season, young Brian O'Neill, talking to the collection about the step up to the top team. I think it's just that little bit qu quicker, you know, you've, you've, you've got to be that little bit quicker in your thought and that, and uh, there's always some, somebody there to clap you if you're not uh, quick enough, you know. Did you model yourself in any particular player? Not at all, no. Uh, you've got players that you always... Uh, See, he's a great player. I like him. Uh, 
they look at him, you know. Uh, but I've never, never ever sort of re really had a model plan there. You've kept your feet very firmly on the ground, Brian. Is that difficult at times, coming down after, say, a big match against uh, Rangers and Aberdeen or Hearts or whoever, and then you go out maybe with your mates later uh, at night time? I don't really, really think it's hard, hard to uh, sort of come back down, especially I mean, with the people in the Celtic dressing room and also my family. You know, I've got a big family, so they're always quick enough to bring me back down to earth. You're in the first team, or in the first team squad, very much a squad, obviously, at Celtic. What's your ambition? Ambition is just to keep my place as long as possible, and then who knows, you know, who knows. <laughs> There's a great spirit in the dressing room. Do you feel that things are about to turn for self? Uh, I feel with the football that we are we are playing right now, we're not uh, as maybe, maybe some people would say a typical Premier League team. We create and we we always try and play football, which is a big difference. Uh, there's been a couple of top of the table games be between other teams and they haven't been good games. At least when people come, come to see us, they'll always, uh, they'll always expect us to, to try and play f football, which is important, I, I think. Are you aware that you're an example then to young players coming through, that someone is coming through the ranks in these days of million pound players yeah. being bought from elsewhere? Well, I, I think I'm, I'm pro probably even just following on from a couple, couple of players, like uh, Mark McNally, Jerry Craney, Stevie Fulton, uh, etc. You know, uh, there's there's that many many players of of came through the, the Celtic ranks, so I'm sure there's plenty more to come. Hitley, challenged by Galloway, still Hitley. Gary Stevens in space on the right, playing it in there to McCoy. Spackman with the pass back to Cascarino and he equalises for Celtic. 70 minutes, Cascarino's been in the field only a few moments. A nightmare of a pass back there from Spackman. There seemed to be no trouble at all for Rangers. And that was Cascarino scoring only his second goal for Celtic. It was Tony Coyne with the downward header. Spackman with the pass back, Cascarino reacting immediately and sending the ball into the back of the net. Rangers 1, Celtic 1, Spackman can't believe it. Early November saw the signing of defender Tony Mowbray from Middlesbrough. Liam Brady had been looking for someone to replace the popular defender Paul Elliott. This was another part of the jigsaw Liam Brady was trying hard to complete. It's been difficult simply because the quality hasn't been available. Now, it's only just recently I got some encouragement from Middlesbrough and um, he was on our list of, uh, of candidates at the beginning of the season and I'm well pleased that uh, we've got him now even though it's taken until November. I think he's uh, the kind of player that's going to be very useful. He does his own job very well and I think you'll find that he helps other people around him do theirs better. from Van der Van, here's Bet. Looking for that run made by Hillhouse. That's a great ball from Bet. A chance now for Hillhouse. Across it goes the far side for Jess. And Aberdeen take the lead. Hello, Aberdeen to settle on this goal lead, which his service in midfield provided. The trouble there, though, robbed by McStay. That's for Nicholas. Here's Nicholas with a chance for the equaliser. It's fine play by Nicholas. A magical finish from Charlie Nicholas. And it was the creative top of the Celtic side, Paul McStay, who created that. Alvin couldn't get a strong enough touch. Nicholas got away from Greg Watson, dragged the ball wide of Snelders, and that is finishing of the highest class. Here's the edge in defenders. Paul is getting up well against Van de Ven. There's Irvin. Coyne helping it on. Nicholas trying to get in behind Greg Watson. Coyne playing it in. Jenny Craney. Celtic are in front. The goal has been threatened right from the start of the second half. And it's expertly finished by Craney. Coyne did so well. It's a great 
great ball in though from Tommy Coyne with the left foot and Jerry Craig comes flying in and that downward header beats Nelders. Good afternoon Celtic View. Win, lose or draw, the Celtic View reports on events at the club every week. It was Britain's first football club weekly when it was founded by Jack McGinn in 1965 and now has readers worldwide. But how do the staff feel about being described sometimes as football's equivalent of Pravda? Editor Donald Cowie. I would answer that by suggesting that uh, while the Celtic View does tend to to the party line in editorial content, a that is not unreasonable in that it is a Celtic Football Club publication and therefore obviously will promote Celtic Football Club's outlook on any aspect. But at the same time, um, the paper includes a letters page and um, that provides a forum for those who maybe disagree with aspects of the way the club is run and even the way the team is run on occasions. And I would defy anyone who has read the paper uh, studiously over the past two years to deny that all these topics have been raised and have indeed been answered by a club spokesman. Um, progression is inevitable. Uh, it's, it's sometimes hard to look at a product and spotlight what can be improved, but certainly we have plans to add to the, the present contents of the Celtic View. Uh, these, we hope, will include um, use of full colour throughout the paper instead of just the, the four pages as we have at present. Um, and we're looking at uh, the possibility of changes in design and inclusion of slightly more offbeat features, um, a children's section, uh, a quiz, a crossword, these sort of things which will broaden the appeal of the view and uh, we hope to be implementing these in the uh, forthcoming months. It goes into the path of Coyne. Celtic have scored! 14 minutes gone. Tommy Coyne gets his 10th goal of the season. Jubilation among the Celtic players and the supporters. It's cross McKinley. The chance is on! And George Wright, a substitute the ball into the back of the net. Well, testing moments now for the Celtic defence. Bono seems to be unhappy about the position Beard has taken up. Ball breaking clear again. And Craig Levine scores for Hearts. Robertson, person going forward, a great run by the Hearts skipper. He's got Beard in the middle. What a chance for Hearts. Where were you on May the 25th, 1967? Well, if you're old enough, you were in Lisbon or watching Celtic's greatest hour on the box. Celebrations are underway to commemorate the 25th anniversary of the event, the first British team to lift the European Cup. And the man who scored the winning goal, Stevie Chalmers, remembers. Do people still stop you in the street and, and talk to you about the great days with Celtic, and in particular scoring the winning goal in the European Cup? Well, that, that, that's the, the most the, the question that's most asked. You know, how did it feel? I mean, obviously, anybody that scores a goal in any game, be it a cup final or any game, uh, but to be the European Cup final, it's just something special. What happened after the match? Uh, after the match, well, none of us knew where Billy was in the first place. Uh, we were all in the dressing room, we didn't even know he was away for the cup. We only saw that in film. Uh, after the game, um, we had it a few hours with the wives, uh, and then took them back to the airport, and thought, right, we'll get back to the hotel and we'll get a, a wee refresh, a wee bit of celebration. By the time we get back to the hotel, everybody's tired, couldn't get a drink anywhere, uh, it was back to bed. It was almost an, an anti-climax after the game? After the game was an anti-climax. I remember one official, uh, saying, oh, it's like a for you, I think we could beat here. Couldn't get a drink. <laughs> What's your one abiding memory, if there is one? Uh, I think the homecoming is when we, we returned here to Glasgow and uh, seeing the, the streets lined up to the park 
go around the bus and that. I'd never saw as many grown-up men crying. And it was just tears of joy, you know. And then coming into the park here and the place being full of spectators, it was just absolutely terrific. 25 years on, do you think it's been an unfair burden on the players of recent years being reminded of the success of the, the 60s and 70s teams? Well, that, that is a possibility. Uh, it's, I would like to think it, that it should lead the other players, the younger players now, to say, look, how would we like to do this, you know, and I, and I step forward for them. Absolutely perfect, even although every player still complaining at the linesman. But a terrific finish. Next day. In this break, it goes to Kenny. He's onside. A great chance for the third. A fine goal from Jerry Kenny. That settled it without question for Celtic. Well, it created by McStay. It'll be interesting to see this one again because I feel that Jerry Craney might have been in an offside position here. Good finish, nevertheless. But the linesman bang in line with Craney. No, in actual fact, he's getting played onside by Chris Honor. And clinically finished. Throughout the winter months, there was growing discontent among many Celtic fans about the running of the club. One of the first public displays of concern was at a meeting at Shettleston, organised by the Save Ourselves campaign, and attended by Chief Executive Terry Cassidy. Many quarters have uh, expressed some surprise at, at uh, Terry Cassidy's agreement to come here this afternoon, and I've uh, likened it to entering the lion's den. I'd like to ask Mr Cassidy, first of all, if Liam Brady's ability to compete in the transfer market will be hindered by the fact that he's got huge sums of money to raise to build a proper stadium that Celtic fans deserve. As well as trying to raise money for a stadium, people also forget that once you've got it, it needs maintaining and it needs running. And that will need, that need an awful lot of money as well. So what we're trying to do is to um, keep the two issues separate so that when we finally got the stadium and that's financed however it may be financed that um, traditional monies i.e. monies that come through turnstiles monies that come through uh, the sale of Celtic products um, pies chips as well and all the rest of it um, that they can be they can be um, kept for really the two reasons why you run a football club and in my book you only run a football club for, for two groups of people one is the supporters and the other one is the team and if it can be um, arranged that that's the way the finances are, uh, then the stadium issue and the cost of the stadium issue will have no effect on monies available to the manager or not available to the manager. What qualities are necessary to be an effective director of a football club? Well, what you've got to do is start asking, what, first of all, what kind of a football club? 
because there are football clubs which are run by one man and that one man effectively does what he wants and any directors on the board do as they are told so if you want that sort of a football club it doesn't matter what qualities the directors have got they'll just do as they're told if they don't do as they're told they get removed and he puts somebody else on if you want to talk about um, a football club which is run as a business and is structured as a business then clearly the criteria needed by those directors uh, are the same ones that you would look for in industry the directors of major companies like ICI or any other major company so it depends what sort of football club you want it's already been said by somebody here today at the table that pretty much all football clubs are badly run and I would think uh, I wouldn't disagree with that too much but perhaps what somebody might do is to give credit for Celtic for trying to break that mold and maybe we are trying to run the football club properly but turning around the QE2 is harder than turning around a rowing boat on a park leg. And I think if somebody would give us a little bit of credit for what we're trying to do, and as I said before, talk's cheap. Um, if I don't do what I'm paid to do, then I'll get fired, and that's the way it should be, because that's what I'll deserve. But I can't, and nobody can, take Celtic Football Club from its present problems and overnight make them into a highly successful football club. But that is the objective of Celtic Football Club. I believe, as already said down here, it's the objective of everybody within this room. We are united in that, that we're all here for Celtic. It's certainly the objective of the board, and it's certainly ob of the objective of people like myself, Liam Brady, and everybody else that works within Celtic Football Club. the face of goal. Welsh is in there. Brian Welsh. Here's a familiar sight. Charlie Nicholas celebrating another of his classic goals for Celtic in his own inimitable style. But how many of us have wondered, what's this all about? A question a Celtic collection viewer put to Charlie. I have a question here from Mark McNally. I think it is from uh, Bells Hill. Ask me what the sign is I do with Vigil Miller after I score a goal. Well, Mark, the, the thing is, it's from a film taken from uh, The Three Amigos, and it was myself, Andy Walker, and me, Joe, who decided to do this. If you watch the film, you'll understand it in a bit more detail. Uh, we're, we're pretty poor at it, to be honest, but it uh, ended up with Andy not playing. Me and Joe were the two amigos, or the one and a half amigos, as far as Joe's concerned. So that's uh, the answer to your question, hopefully. to Spikeman, is strong enough to get through White. Here's Dale Gordon, this is a good chance for Rangers, right on the half-time whistle. Cross to Haidley, here's McCoyst! It's first blood to Rangers, right on the half-time whistle. Now he's corner, driven in, and a bulleted header from Tony Mowbray. Equaliser scored by Mowbray. We're just five minutes into the second half. And this driven corner kick from Galloway finding his way through to Tony Mowbray on the run. Got in there ahead of Haitley. And that's a magnificent header. Well, what an equaliser. Mowbray getting across in front of Haitley, who won't be too happy with his marking. So it's Haitley against Marshall. Beautifully taken penalty kick. Rangers are back in front. John Burns in the middle. Now 
Costa on the left, McCoy's in the inside right position, here's Brown going all the way himself, that settles it! Injuries to key players made it impossible for Liam Brady to field anything like a settled side, and Brian Scott became one of the busiest men at Celtic Park. Yeah, we've had a particularly heavy spell, um, you know, games and injuries, and um, every game is throwing up another injury for us, you know, one sort or another, whether it's with the first team or the reserves, or even with the, you know, the under-18s, or the, to a lesser degree, the under-18s. Do you think the extra games are taking its toll already? Yeah, I, f I feel it is. Um, you know, the, the, talking to the other physios with other teams, and they're, they're experiencing similar uh, predicaments to what we are. Um, the only saving grace is with having larger, you know, player pools here. Um, it's slightly easier on the players because there's some players that are actually turning out in games where they're no, absolutely nowhere near fit. And, you know, the, the chance of them breaking down in the game is very, very high. you become a familiar figure on and off the pitch during the games, but anything unusual, anything daft happen over the years? Yeah, uh, it actually happened here at Celtic Park when I was with Aberdeen. And uh, Bob Rooney was uh, the physio at the time and nearly was running on, you know, treating injuries. And... It happened just on the uh, just on the halfway line. There was two players, two Celtic players, went down injured. So nearly went to one, and I went to the other. And I saw so him running up behind this guy. And all I could see was a sort of curly hair. And um, I mean, he was, he was lying in a heap. I didn't know for certain who it was. It was either John Doyle or David Proven, I, and I really couldn't tell who it was. The way they were all crunched up. So uh, as I got closer, I thought, oh, it's Doyle, and I said, um, so I goes up, I says, come on, Doyle, I'll, I'll, you know, let's see what's wrong. And David told me, sound out, Doyle, you know, and he was <laughs> screaming and shouting in my face, you know, I was really quite taken aback with it. Um, so and then at the next thing, he stands up, he says, ah, my leg's okay, anyway, and he went off, you know. As but, fast as David Brominant was. Ah, like. you're right, you know, he still gives me a stick about that every four, oh, it's funny, though. Thanks to everyone who wrote to us to say how much you enjoyed the coaching tips in the last edition of the collection. So here's some more from the assistant manager, Tommy Craig. constant change of pace. If he doesn't shout for it, don't give him it. Got to tell you he wants it. Well, throw it hard to his chest. Throw it hard. He's got to control himself in his chest, Stuart. Yeah. This one's basically designed for giving the goalkeeper a little bit of handling, but also incorporating the player's passing. The first pass is supported by the second player, and the goalkeeper is also getting a touch. Nice yes. foot passing. Redirect what you say to your foot. Good. Yes, 
You're basically talking three things here. The actual pass, the support for the pass, and the fact that the goalkeeper's getting a bit of work in the meantime. Good, good pace in the first pass, good pace. It's pass, support it, okay. play another pass, okay. and then it's the next one coming in, good. You've probably noticed in, in, in this routine in particular that we're trying to keep the pace of the, the exercise up. And part of, the, part of the reason for that is to do with the, the nature of the, the Premier League. Because it's played at such a, a hectic and frantic pace, we try and gear our training towards the same kind of pace. It's not how everyone would like it. There are times whereby it's, it's, it's maybe better to watch, whereby the pace is, is dropped and you get maybe more better passing and flowing movements. But as I say, such is the nature of the Premier League. But uh, we, we try to gear our training towards the same kind of pace. Celtic had to win this game to maintain even a remote interest in the league championship. And a misjudgment by St Johnston's Paul Cherry gave them the ideal start. The scorer, Captain Paul McStay, the player Celtic are desperately trying to keep at Parkhead. In the second half, though, Saints pushed Celtic back and forced an equaliser. Scored by recently signed Irish striker Vinnie Arkins. This controlled passing was the build-up to the crucial second goal, which was later to cause some debate about who scored. Tommy Coyne on the ground claiming a touch, but Gary Gillespie gets the credit for his header. Spurred on by that, Coyne started and finished the third, with some help from Joe Miller. So 3-1 for Celtic, who are now well on top. And Miller was again involved in the fourth. The scorer this time, John Collins. Near the end, St Johnston pulled one back through substitute Paul Wright. A cracking goal, but it couldn't take away from Celtic's return to form. Tony, how are you feeling now that um, you've been at Celtic for a few months and um, hopefully the injury over now? Uh, how do you feel? Well, just looking forward to it, really. It's um, been a frustrating couple of months. Um, but, I mean, on the plus side, I've sat and had a good look at Scottish football and, and what it's all about. And... Um, I'm quite confident I can face the challenge of, of getting back into the side after my injury and um, just looking forward to doing well and, and, and hopefully the club doing well. Is there a difference coming to a club like Celtic from Middlesbrough? Middlesbrough, an area where they're passionate about football. Mm -hmm. It's the same in Glasgow, but maybe even more so. Yes, I'd say more so. I think <coughs> um, obviously there's, there's more Celtic supporters than there's Middlesbrough supporters and also the, the rivalry in the city with, um, with the Rangers as, as well maybe intensifies that, that you know, passionate support. But um, I mean, I'm lucky to have played now for, for two clubs with where football, you know, is almost life and death to people, and, and, and that and that important, um, which is what the game's all about. I'm a passionate football supporter as well as, as a player, and um, hopefully I can do justice to the supporters. You said to the fans when you came, "Don't compare me with Paul Elliott. I'm a different kind of player." But you must have been impressed the way the fans took you to their hearts immediately. Yes, very much so. It was a. I don't know, it's a case of me as a player of just trying to reproduce what I've been doing for 10 years at Middlesbrough and not to add any extra fills or not to try and con people to, to say I'm a player that I'm not um, just to do what I'm good at which hopefully is, is attack the ball in the box get it out away from danger and if, if people take to that then that's, that's, that's good by me John Collins sets up Tommy Coyne But a solid save from Billy Thompson matches the striker's shot. The play was flowing from both sides now and this move from Celtic created the chance for Polish international Darius Dovczyk to test Thompson again. Parried by the keeper and cleared by Motherwell's midweek signing Rob McKinnon. 
More Celtic pressure followed and a clever understanding between Coyne and Jerry Quinney sets up another shooting opportunity. And brings out another great save from Thompson. Quinney sends Miller clear, there's no offside and the winger is clean through. Thompson does well again though and the eventual clearance by Luke Nyholt. Celtic were soon back on the attack. Quinney's pass to Coyne and Dovchek is again looking for the shooting chance. Dovchek seems to be involved in everything now. This pass to Coyne and after some good skill from the striker a spectacular finish. Thompson's brilliant save from substitute Steve Fulton. The first silverware of the season came in January in the shape of the Tenant Sixes. There was a huge Celtic support at the SECC in Glasgow, particularly for the final against St. Johnson. Chris Morris to Cascarino. 1-0 to Celtic. Tony Cascarino gets his third goal of the tournament. It was laid on by Morris. And they've got one back. Roddy Grant makes it one goal apiece. Collins will try the shot. A magnificent strike by John Collins. So John Collins gets his seventh goal of the tournament. A terrific strike there with the left foot. Close down by Collins. Play by John Collins. Now it's Cascarino. He's got Crini there. Jerry Crini! So Crini gets his fifth goal of the competition. A fine strike. Trying to find the opening. It's on for Grant. Well, Roddy Grant's fourth goal. 50 seconds to go. Joe Miller can finish it. Joe Miller gets his 10th goal of the tournament. A lovely little dummy there. Wrong footing the goalkeeper. So John Collins, the Celtic skipper for this tournament, coming forward to receive the Tenant Sixers trophy from Mr. John Hamilton, the trade marketing director of Tenant. The delight in the face of John Collins. Jerry Crenny there. The final touch deftly applied by Jerry Craney and Celtic are one up. It was from this move that Celtic scored the second. Brian O'Neill's pass puts the Montrose defence in all kinds of trouble. And Tommy Coyne takes full advantage, scoring the second goal in two minutes. Celtic finally scored the third five minutes before half time, started by Brian O'Neill. and finished by Tommy Coyne. And that's number two for Craney. That was Jerry Craney's hat-trick and Tommy Coyne wasn't going to be outdone even if he had to rely on help from substitute Tony Cascarino's powerful challenge. Tom Boyd hopes to repeat his Tenant Scottish Cup success, this time in the hoops. Last May, he led Motherwell to victory at Hampden, and after a spell at Chelsea, he joined the club he'd supported as a boy. Yeah, well, the first I heard, uh, it was a, true, it was a couple of days uh, before I signed, where the manager just spoke to me, and he says there's a chance, if you want it, to swap, have a swap deal with Tony Cascarino. Uh, and then it was all subject to me coming up and talking to Liam Brady. 
a lot's happened in just nine months, ten months since you lifted the Scottish Cup with Motherwell. Did you think you'd be back playing in the green-white hoop so quickly? No, definitely not, because uh, as you said, I signed a five-year contract. I wanted to make that stick. I would like to have stayed there a few years, but uh, I think we had a chance to, to come back to Scotland and play for Celtic, who I did support when I was younger. Uh, and then the wife took it back, and it was a big factor. And yeah, I was just delighted that the chance arose. Did you enjoy playing in the English First Division? What was the difference, Tom, between uh, the Premier League and the First Division? The, the, the main difference, I would say, is that there's, there's a more better quality of player. Uh, there's more of them. Well, and up here there's not so many, but down there there's a, there's a lot more quality players. Uh, I wouldn't say the game is any slower. Uh, it's just, uh, I think, as I said, there's more quality of player. They give themselves more time in the ball. But the game's just as quick down there. There's not a lot of difference to that side. But just a quality player, I would think, would be the, the main difference. High quality and calibre of player here at Celtic. A very big pool. Yeah, uh, well, I know uh, the standard. I, I knew all their names. That helps to settle in because it was a sport. You, you watch what they're doing. Uh, and I know the quality of players, yeah, John Collins, just makes stay, Brian, you know, they're, they're all comfortable on the ball uh, and if they can just continue that, and they're on a good run at the moment to, to hopefully bring success at the end of the season. You come in a long line of successful Marvel players to Celtic, Dixie Deans, Joe McBride, Brian McClare, Andy Walker and now Tom Boyd. Yes, uh, well, uh, as you say, I had a bit of success with Mother when we won the Cup, so I want to get success here, it's been long overdue. Uh, Celtic, I think, you know, we two seasons without a trophy. We don't want to make that a third. We don't want to make that a third. We want to go and lift out the Scottish Cup at the end of this season. Gillespie started to come forward and has gone back, leaving uh, Derek White to try and make an impression with the flick on. Got to send them up, Martin. The United have left no one upfield. Oh, it's Forster, and uh, at last Jerry Quiney can wear a smile of satisfaction. But a terrible mistake by Van der Kamp, who started the game so spectacularly. Well, it's very greasy. I suppose it's inevitable that if anyone was going to open the scoring, it would be Jerry Craney. That's a bread and butter catch that Craney and Coyne both go in. But full match to Jerry Craney went in with real determination. Watch this. Goes in. That's mine. I want to score a goal. He bundles it over the line. Cleland. Here's Jackson. The referee playing a good advantage then as Jackson is fouled. Bowman's cross. And McInally, Patalainen, 1-1, one, one. the response is quick. Here's Nicholas. Coin! At last for Celtic. And Tommy Coin has done it against the club that let him go. five minutes left and just at the time you thought United had done enough they've relaxed for a minute Joe Miller again Martin the man who's looked to provide all the ammunition has been tonight Tommy Coyne pulls brilliantly away from the defenders and just guides ahead of Gordon Marshall describes this season as a dream come true currently the holder of the number one jersey he's also a dab hand with the scissors as I discovered when I met him in the referees room at Celtic Park. Gordon, when you signed for Celtic, did you believe that uh, in February you'd be the regular first team goalkeeper? No, I thought I would have had to wait a long time. Uh, I thought it was going to be either Packy getting a rest or getting injured. I had no idea I was going to get a chance so early. A big difference coming to Celtic and playing in front of such a big crowd. What about the Celtic supporters? They've been good. Uh, I don't think they've had anything to shout about yet. So. Yeah, they've been good. They've uh, encouraged us when I went out for the warm-ups. Uh, they've applauded when I've done the right thing. And they've kept quiet when they've done the wrong thing, so it's been quite good. And how do you combine it with uh, cutting the hair? I believe often after training, as you're doing at the moment, uh, you've got some of the players in here. Who do you have in the list? Uh, I've got a few guys in the list. Uh, 
big bats won, so uh, it's quite good. Uh, it's all good publicity for me uh, with the hairdressing business, and uh, they have no complaints so far with the things that have been done. The boss is another one. Uh, Mike Martin's <laughs> just already given me a shout. He's wanting a wee. That'll be a so quick haircut. It won't be, but <laughs> <laughs> he spends that long telling us what he wants, then uh, I have to decide then what I'm going to do. What was your most difficult moment, Gordon? I suppose you could say, what was your closest shave during your time in the first team? It has to be the, the Rangers game. It was McCoy's. Marshall came to meet him. He couldn't keep his hands on the ball, though. But I uh, picked myself up and uh, we lost another goal, but I think uh, that one was uh, the killer for us. Celtic attack so often, it can be difficult for the Celtic goalkeeper to keep concentration. Um, do you have any special routines that you do during the match? Yeah, well I've asked Packy and I've also asked Joe Corrigan about how do they manage to keep themselves concentrating throughout the game because they don't get much to do, meaning Packy, uh, when he was playing. You maybe only get asked upon once or twice in a game. And they've told me some small routines and that to just keep yourself occupied. And uh, they've worked so far, because a few of the games have had nothing to do until the last five minutes and managed to do them. Gillespie surveying the scene for the free kick. Right. The only player up for Hibbs is Gareth Evans. Good play by Celtic. He'll shot to Nicholas. Brilliant play from Celtic. Hibbs were carved open by that intricate move with Nicholas at his best. What well, a great piece of play it was. Collins in the back, killed it initially. Trini helping it on there to Nicholas and body to his left without a hope. Nicholas taking this corner. This time Gillespie has gone up. Back again with Nicholas. That's for Collins. The chance is on from the goal. 2 0 to Celtic. Jerry Trini is the scorer. And Hibbs badly caught out in defence. From the corner kick, the clearance was indecisive. This was a great ball played back inside, though, by Nicholas. It was caught there by Collins, who stabbed it into the gap. Trini was on his own, he wasn't picked up. And Burridge again was left isolated and helpless. And now the competition. Can you name this current Celtic player? Well, if you can, you could be coming along to Celtic Park for a VIP day out for two. Champagne reception, free car parking there, tour of the trophy room, meeting some of the personalities at Celtic Park and enjoying the match against Infermline, April the 25th. All you have to do is write to us here at the Celtic Collection. We had hundreds of entries for the last competition and the following were the winners of the Celtic away strips. Was sprinting past him. Good play by the fullback. Tommy Coyne going for that with Henry Smith. Chances on. It's the perfect start for Celtic. Eight minutes of the match gone. And this was down to the overlapping play of Chris Morris. That was brilliant fullback play. The near post ball. Henry Smith came for that with Tommy Coyne. The ball up in the air for Coyne. Trini was there first when the ball came across. I reckon the chipped free kick would be favoured. There it goes. And Trini gets up well for that. It's the second ball for Celtic. Henry Smith was caught in no man's land. And Trini punished him. The big man will be stuck for this free kick. Trini was not well enough. Henry Smith caught a couple of yards off his line. Finley's free kick. There's McKinley fighting it. 
It's off them, hanging in the air. A clumsy challenge by Gillespie. It certainly appeared to be a foul. And a penalty kick correctly awarded. There's Robertson against Marshall. Last word goes to the manager, Liam Brady, on the progress so far. Well, I've always been happy, really, with the way they've been playing. Um, I think if you look at the, uh, at the league table, you see uh, that our goals against record is not the best, and it's not. Um, it's really stopped us from from being in a more challenging position. So we seem to have sorted that out. Um, and if we can keep keep it going along the lines we are, we're certainly making progress. And yes, we are much more consistent, and results have been good. Really. The new year wrecked our league chances. Uh, those two games in the space of four days, losing at home to Rangers and to Hearts, uh, put paid uh, to our to our title challenge. Although it's not over yet, but uh, as Rangers keep on winning week in week out, it's, it's getting increasingly difficult. The cup for Celtic has been a source of joy over many many years, and so far so good this time. Well, that's right. Uh, people, uh, well, I was obviously aware of the great tradition Celtic have uh, have had in the cup over the years, and. Uh, when we started out, I was reminded of it. So uh, we've uh, had two good results. Uh, the Montrose was obviously a very easy game, where we made it very easy. Whereas the Dundee United was very difficult. Uh, but the most pleasing thing about that was we kept it going for 90 minutes and we kept our passing game going. Uh, I'm sure the fans uh, really appreciated the way the team played, and we got our just rewards in the end. Tom Boyd arrived in February. Tony Cascarino departing. How do you feel about that episode? Uh, well, obviously, sorry that uh, the Cascarino situation didn't work out. Um, I was convinced he would do a very good job for Celtic with his aerial power, his height, uh, and his presence leading the line. But it wasn't to be. Uh, and to be fair, the people who had to contest the places alongside him, such as Green, Ecoy, and Nicholas, uh, have delivered. And it was becoming increasingly more difficult for Tony. So um, I was pleased to get uh, Tom Boyd in a, in a straight swap in the end because uh, Tom. Uh, can play left back, uh, he can play other positions as well and I think he's going to be uh, a great asset to the club and he's going to contribute greatly to what we're trying to do. Another popular figure is big Tony Mowbray. Obviously you've not seen as much of him as you would have liked because of injury but uh, he looks a very good buy. Yes, uh, well, extremely disappointed that Tony hasn't been on the field uh, enough. Um, I think our fans saw uh, in his performances against uh, against Rangers, especially against Haitley, Aberdeen, he, he was great up there. Uh, that he's going to be a real leader of our defence, and that's what we need in there. Some to 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 get the best out of the likes of Gillespie, the best out of White, Galloway. Uh, so uh, looking forward to him coming back. I think there'll be a great difference to our defence. You're certainly getting the best out of your captain this season, Paul McStay. Yeah, yeah, people that, you know, this is my first season at Celtic and, uh, and people have told me that, uh, numerous amount of people have told me this is Paul's best season. So that's uh, great to be part of that. He certainly is a, uh, a fine player uh, and he's so important for, for me because we've got a uh, fairly young midfield. We've got, like, O'Neill, he's only 19. We've got John Collins, 23, and John Miller, 23. Uh, so to have Paul in there leading the way is... Uh, is very important. It's the other national pastime, asking what about Paul McStay? What can you say to viewers to the Celtic collection about Paul? Well, um, I would just like to reassure them that we're doing everything possible uh, to keep him here. Uh, we're, uh, we have sat down and we've talked financially. Paul, is obviously, it's a huge decision for him uh, what to do at this point in his career, and he's taking his time about, uh, about telling us what he wants to do, and we've got to give him as much time as he needs. Well, that's it from this edition of the Celtic Collection. I do hope you've enjoyed it. Remember that competition, get your answers into us, and any questions you want to put to anybody at Celtic Park, send it to us at the Celtic Collection, PO Box 166, Glasgow G2 6BY. While the whistle's gone, time has beaten us once again. We look forward to you joining us for the next Celtic Collection, Part 3. Until then, from me, Paul Cooney, on behalf of everyone involved, bye-bye for now.